Our Bible passage tonight comes from 1 Thessalonians chapters 2 and 3. That's 1 Thessalonians chapters 2 and 3. You know, brothers, that our visit to you was not a failure. We had previously suffered and had been insulted in Philippi, as you know, but with the help of our Lord, we dared to tell you his gospel in spite of strong opposition. For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as men approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please men, but God who tests our heart. You know we never use flattery, nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. We are not looking for praise from men, not from you, nor anyone else. As apostles of Christ, we could have been a burden to you, but we were gentle among you, like a mother caring for her little children. We loved you so much that we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well, because you have become so dear to us. Surely you remember, brothers, our toll, our hardship. We work day and night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preach the gospel of God to you. You are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we are among you who believed. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God, who calls you into his kingdom and glory. And we also thank God continually because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but as it actually is the word of God, which is at work in you who believe. For you brothers became imitators of God's churches in Judea, which are in Christ Jesus. You suffered from, from your own countrymen the same things those churches suffered from the Jews who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out. They displease God and are hostile to all men in their effort to keep us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. In this way, they are always heap up their sin to the limit to the wrath of God has come upon them at last. But brothers, when we were torn away from you in a short time, in person, not in thought, out of our intense longing, we made every effort to see you, for we wanted to come to you. Certainly I, Paul, did again and again, but Satan stopped us. For what is our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we will give glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes? Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and joy. So when we could stand it no longer, we thought it best to be left by ourselves in Athens. We sent Timothy, who is our brother and God's fellow worker in spreading the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you in your faith, so that no one would be unsettled by these trials. You know quite well that we were destined for them. In fact, when we were with you, we kept telling you that we would be persecuted, and it turned out that way, as well as you well know. For this reason, when I could stand it no longer, I sent to find out about your faith. I was afraid that in some way the tempter might have tempted you, and our efforts might have been useless. But Timothy has just now come to us from you and has brought good news about your faith and love. He has told us that you always have pleasant memories of us and that you long to see us just as we also long to see you. Therefore, brothers, in all our distress and persecution, we are encouraged about you because, you're, because of your faith. For now, we st for now we really live, since you are standing firm in the Lord. How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy we have in the presence of our God because of you? Night and day we pray most earnestly that we may see you again and supply what is lacking in your faith. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus clear the way for us to come to you. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else just as ours does for you. May he strengthen your hearts 
so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father and when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. Well, please stay open there in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and 3. It's a big section. It's really one section that keeps flowing in the argument and showing Paul's interaction and Silas's and Timothy's interaction with the the Thessalonian church. So we we really want to skim through all of this and see their interaction in a particular way. So stay open there. We're not going to be able to look at every single verse and we're not going to be able to read out every single verse again. But if you keep keep it open and keep your eyes open, you'll be able to look at, at it as I refer to it and catch on what I'm saying. So please have your Bibles open as we continue through this. Uh, Let's pray before we get into it. Father, we thank you that we can now consider your word. We thank you for how it speaks to our lives and that it continues to grip us, continues to pierce us and challenge us. And we pray that it would do this right now. We need your word to convict us. We can grow so dull towards you and towards your word, and towards living for you. And so we pray that you would change us, and that you would help us to live lives that would honour and glorify you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. What is it to truly live? What is the fulfilled life? How would you finish this sentence? We really live if. We really live if. We really live if we have the Australian dream, maybe you would say. We really live if we own our own home and have a good family, a nice car, a boat or a holiday house. We really live if we have achieved great accomplishments in life and we've been noticed for them. Or maybe you'd say we really live if we have abounded in good and doing good and have become a great leader maybe in something. How would the Christian finish that sentence? We really live if. Well, Paul, Silas and Timothy finish that question for us, if you noticed in the passage. They say in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 8, For now we really live since you are standing firm in the Lord. For them, to live is to see believers stand firm in the Lord. And to not have that is like death to them. It's not that saying that they're going to go out of existence if they don't have this happen and if the Thessalonians don't endure, but this strong language here is being used to show that their life and their fulfilment in life is when they see these believers endure. And the next verse links this phrase, we really live to the word joy and to their joy. Have a look. Verse 9 says, how can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy we have in the presence of our God because of you. The Thessalonians bring deep joy to Paul, Silas and Timothy because they are standing firm in the faith and they are the joy and life of Paul, Silas and Timothy. And because of this, they have a longing to see them and to be with them. That's what verse 10 then goes on to say. You can see the flow of the argument. Verse 10 then goes on to say, chapter 3, 1 Thessalonians, chapter 3, Verse 10, night and day we pray most earnestly that we may see you again and supply what is lacking in your faith. Why do they long to see them? To supply what's lacking in their faith. And it's because they see that the endurance of the faith of the Thessalonians will bring them joy. And when they see that happen, that is when they really live. Earlier in Thessalonians, in chapter 2, verse 19, and 20, have a look. They've already spoken in a similar way. They said this about the Thessalonians in chapter 2, verse 19 to 20. For what is our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes? Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and joy. The Thessalonians here are the hope, the glory, the crown, the joy of Paul, Silas, and Timothy. And when they see them grow, when they see them endure in the faith, it brings them joy and it's the greatest reward that they could possibly have. And Paul uses some similar language, I think, in another book, in Philippians. We see he uses some similar language. Have a look there quickly. Philippians chapter 1, if you flick back a few books. Philippians chapter 1, 
we see Paul and he's saying how he, he longs to depart from this world. He longs to leave it and to be with Christ because he knows that's far better. So that's where he wants to go. But there's an essential reason for why he has to remain. And he says it in Philippians 1, verse 23 to 26. Have a listen. Paul says, I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. So that through my being with you again, your joy in Christ will overflow on account of me. Paul sees that he needs to remain and live and continue living for one reason. And that reason is so that he would see these people overflow with joy in Christ. So they would have great reason to find joy in Christ. And so they would progress in their faith and in their joy in Christ. And that's why he remains. Paul knew that every day he was given breath. Every day he was given another breath. It was for this purpose. It was to do this. That was Paul's priority. And it should be ours as well. It should be ours as well. We really live and gain joy and delight when we help others delight in God. And therefore, we must live to do this and to help people find joy in Jesus. If you remember last week, we looked at delighting in God and how we must do that and how we can do that. And I said that this week we're going to look at how to help others delight in God. And this is what we're talking about. How do we help others delight in God and find joy in Christ? How do we do this? This is essential because this is what we're seeing here. Life is about. This is the purpose God has left us with. That's why you have arms. That's why you have eyes and mouths and feet. God has left you with the, these things with this purpose. God has given you another breath and another day to do these things. And so you need to ask, is this why you're living? Is this what you're aiming at and trying to do with your life? Is this your priority to see other people overflow with their joy in Christ? Is this how you sum up your day? When you wake up, do you, you wake up thinking, this is another day for me to help people find joy in Christ? Is that how you wake up, thinking about your day? Do you think in everything that you do, in every, situa in every situation, in every moment that you're given by God, do you think, how can I help people find joy in Christ? That's the purpose we've been given. Now, if this is our purpose as Christians, to use every moment like this, why does it scarcely happen in our lives at times? Why does it scarcely happen? Think about it. Think about why you came here today. Think about what was on your mind. Why did you want to come? Was there even a thought of this and coming after the service and talking to one another and helping each other do this and find joy in Christ? Was that on our minds when we came? Is it on our minds when we catch up with Christians in the week and meet with them? Do we want to do this in their lives and help them find joy in Christ and help them endure in the faith? Is it, are we thinking about that? Do we even meet with Christians to do that? It's often not on the mind of church leaders in many churches as well. Most leaders in churches are thinking about buildings, thinking about budgets, and thinking and acting even elders who should be shepherding the flock. They're just acting like a board committee that makes decisions. But they're not thinking about this. How can we help people find joy in Christ? Our leaders in some churches, aren't thinking like this. And they aren't thinking through, how can we provide our sheep the rich pastures that they need to find joy in Christ? And, and we can fail to do it as well, in, and it can show how we're failing to do this and how we're failing to see this as our purpose in how little people attend church or in how quickly we want to leave after church and not talk to anyone or in how little we want to meet with other Christians through the, through the week to help encourage them and grow them. For the most part, often we, as a church, the Christian church as a whole, neglects this purpose. I think we can ne really neglect this purpose to want to see each other endure in the faith, to grow each other and mature each other. Really, I'm saying to disciple one another. Yet this is what life is all about. And we, Paul said, 
We really live if we do this. But maybe you're thinking, and I want to tackle this, maybe you think that's just for Paul. That's just his role to help people find joy in Christ. That's not for all of us. Or maybe that's just for pastors, elders, and maybe missionaries. But not for me. I'm just an average Christian. That's not for me. I want you to see, before we get into a bit more, I want you to see that this is your purpose. And I can say this is your purpose as well for Christians, for all of us. And it's important for all of us. Why can I say that? Well, because Jesus left us with this. He left us to do this. Right at the end of Matthew, some of the last words Jesus leaves with his disciples are this. He says in Matthew 28, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. The 12 disciples of Jesus, they're told to go and make disciples. And they're told to go and teach those disciples to obey all the commands that Jesus has given. And what's the most recent command that Jesus has given? Verse 18, to go and make disciples. Therefore, the ones who they make disciples of, those who they make disciples of, that's us far down the line. They are to teach those people to go and make disciples as well. So this command here in Matthew 28 didn't just apply to the 12, it applies to us as well as disciples of Christ. And so there's a call on us to go and make disciples. And at the heart of making disciples is really seeing people delight in Christ and follow Him. What we've been talking about already from some of the other letters that Paul writes. We see here that this is a command and a call on all of us as Christians And we see here as well, it's important we realise, we don't make disciples by enforcing that people's obedience. We bring about disciples by helping them delight in Christ. And out of a love for Him, they want to obey. We don't want to bring about obedience through duty. And that's why we see how Paul describes it. He, He describes it as helping people to overflow with joy in Christ, because that's when they will obey what Christ has said. And it's because when people do that, When people obey, not out of duty, but out of a delight for Christ, and out of a delight in God, then God gets the glory, and His worth is shown in it. And that's the second reason why this is a key purpose for us. Going and making disciples, helping people to find joy in Christ, this is a key purpose for us, because God is glorified in it. God is glorified in this. This is so key. We see the great worth of God is shown when people follow Him and when people find joy in Him. And when we aim to give people great reason to find joy in Christ, we're bringing about God's glory in that. And so this is why we must exist. And this is why our purpose is to see other people follow Christ and find joy in Him. And then a third reason why I'm saying that this is for all of us, this isn't just for Paul, this is for all of us, third reason why this is for all of us is because helping others to find joy in Christ is for our joy and our good as well. We've already seen this a bit. We've seen in chapter 3, back in Thessalonians, if you want to go back there, chapter 3 of Thessalonians, it said, verse 8 and 9, we really live since you're standing firm in the faith. How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy we have in the presence of God because of you? Helping People stand firm in their faith. It brings joy. It brought joy to poor Silas and Timothy. But they're not the only ones it brought joy to. In 2 John, we read this, 2 John 4. John writes, I rejoice greatly to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as we were commanded by the Father. And later, 3 John 4, I have no greater joy, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Very similar to what we've been hearing from Paul. No greater joy than to hear my children walking in the truth. This is why we should seek this as well. We should want to see people grow to know Christ and to follow Him because it's for our joy as well. So this isn't an optional extra. 
for us as Christians. If you want joy, if you want what's best for you, if you want to glorify God, if you want to grow people and give them what they most need, if you want to do what Jesus left you to do, if you want to obey Him as your Savior and Lord, if you're a Christian, then you must disciple and you must grow others to find joy in Christ. Now, I've used that word a bit, make disciples or discipling. What do I mean by that? Well, Paul's already shown us, I think, some examples. He's already said how we are to seek people's progress and joy in the faith. That's a way of saying make disciples. He said we need to give people ample reason to find joy in Christ. He said that we are to seek for people to stand firm in the faith. These are all ways of describing what it is to make disciples. To sum it up, I would say that to make disciples is to nurture and equip others to fully follow Jesus. And we see this throughout chapter 2 and chapter 3 of Thessalonians. Now, we need to realize this, this work of discipling, that's what it is. That's quite broad. It can happen, happen in many ways. We need to not box it in. We need to not think that discipling only happens in a sermon, in a Bible study, through courses, or even just through individual mentoring and some formal mentoring relationship. This isn't the only place that discipling can happen. It can happen in many facets and in many ways. And our passage in Thessalonians here, which we've been seeing, it's one key way where we see some great pictures of discipling. And we see Paul, Silas and Timothy really fulfill this call to disciple. Though the language of discipling isn't used here, you can see at the heart of behind everything they're doing, they are growing these Thessalonians to follow Christ. And at the heart of what they're doing is discipling. And I think some of the clearest pictures for us to learn about discipling are through Paul and his interactions with individuals and churches, which we get in the epistles. There's some great examples of discipling. So I hope as we go through the rest of this passage in chapter 2 and 3 and see a few things, I hope we can see here their example and learn from it and be helped by it because this is our purpose as well to see people find joy in Christ, to make disciples, to give them ample reason to glory in Christ. So let's go back to the beginning of the Thessalonians and Paul's and Silas's interaction. Because it began back in Acts 17. In Acts 17, we see that they're taught the gospel. The Thessalonians are taught by Silas and Paul the gospel, and their visit is successful. In chapter 17, verse 4, it says that some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas as did many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. So we see here, Paul and Silas go and proclaim the gospel and some believe, some believe. And then in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, we're really getting there a picture of what they did at that time among them. And you would have seen some of the things that they did at that time among them. And we get some great pictures here of discipling. How did the how did Paul, Silas, and Timothy interact with the Thessalonians? Well, here we see some of it in 1 Thessalonians 2. And we are taught some key things that we should be using, that we should be doing in our discipling as well. So have a look. In chapter 2, verse 6, we'll jump to, we see Paul says how they could have been a burden. They say they could have been a burden in the sense they could have asked for physical and financial support, but verse 9 shows that they weren't like this. They worked night and day, they worked hard to not be a burden while while they were preaching the gospel. And instead of being a burden to them and receiving care from the Thessalonians, they were in fact caring for the Thessalonians. And it says this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 6b, as apostles of Christ, we could have been a burden to you, but we were gentle among you. Like a mother caring for her little children, we loved you so much that we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well, because you had become dear to us. Surely you remember, brothers, our toil and hardship. We worked night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preached the gospel of God to you. There's two pictures here we see of discipling. The first one here we see is that as we disciple, we are to be like a mother, to those we disciple. We are to be like a mother to those we disciple. That's what Paul, Silas and Timothy were to the Thessalonians. You would have seen it there, right there in verse 7. 
And we are to be like this as we interact with each other and seek to care for one another. We need to seek to be like a spiritual parent to others, to come alongside them, to desire to spiritually nourish, feed, warn, protect, and care for them, just like a mother does with children. We need to be doing this with other people in the church. And I guess a way to apply this is, can you, yourself, describe a relationship where you're doing this with someone? Where you're spiritually doing these things with them? It's probably going to be someone younger in the faith. And it's probably going to be someone who may be less mature in the faith. But are you doing this with them? Are you seeking to be like a mother to them? To spiritually care for them? To warn them? To teach them? To correct them? To help them in the faith? to grow them. Do you have someone that you're doing this with? Secondly, we see another picture here of discipling, and we see that it is that we need to share our life with those we disciple. That's what Paul, Silas, and Timothy did. They shared their lives with them. We saw it in verse 8. Chapter 2, verse 8. They say, We loved you so much that we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well, because you had become so dear to us. And we see the example of it as well earlier in chapter 1. Chapter 1, the middle of verse 5, they say, You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord in spite of severe suffering. You welcomed the message with joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all believers in Macedonia and Achaia. You see there, Paul, Silas and Timothy, they share their lives with the Thessalonians. They don't hold back. They share their lives. And what happens? The Thessalonians model them, follow their example and imitate them and become a model for others as well. As we disciple, this is a key element to growing one another. We need to be willing to share our lives with each other. And I think it's a big one we need to be more willing for in our Western culture because we're so secluded and we keep away from one another. I really felt this uh, in the house before that we used to live in where I drive up the road windows are down, I haven't talked to anyone coming home from work, I drive in, the neighbour might be out on the street, but we could easily just wave, and you drive up the driveway into your garage, and you close the garage, and you don't see them. That's just a summary of our lives sometimes, we are so secluded from one another, we don't talk with one another, we don't interact with one another, and we even fail to do it as Christians at church, we can leave so quickly where we don't do it. We need to realize that we need to share our lives together, not just come to church, not just go to Bible study, but actually share our lives together and get into each other's lives. Discipling involves this deep work, and this is what Paul, Silas, and Timothy did. And if we are to do this, it's going to take a deep love in us for other people. It's going to take a deep love to be selfless with our time and with our lives so that we can share them with people and invite them in. Because when people are invited in and see how you follow Christ, they're able to see how they should follow Christ in every, every facet of their life as well. People aren't taught how to follow Christ just by meeting with them once a month or once every few months and reading something with them. They're taught how to follow Christ as they see it in someone else. Someone else. That's what Jesus did with his disciples. That's what we are to do as well. Invite people into our lives and share our lives with them. And you can see that that's exactly what Paul and Silas were doing. They said that they did it there in verse 8, but then you can see they bring up three examples of how they did it. Verse 9, it begins with, surely you remember. And he says, do you remember us doing this? And then verse 10, he says, you're witnesses. Remember of us doing this. And then he says in verse 11, for you know that we, this. He shows three examples, how they shared their life with the Thessalonians. So we need to share our lives to disciple and grow one another. And then a third picture we see here, verse 11, verse 10 to 12, we see a third picture of what it is to disciple and how we should interact with each other to care for one another. Have a look. Verse 10, 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 10, you are witnesses and so is God of how holy, righteous and blameless we were among you who believed. You know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging comforting and urging you to live lives worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom. Here again, we see that picture of spiritual parenting. Paul, Silas and Timothy comforting, encouraging, urging the Thessalonians as a father would. And that's what we are to do with one another. 
again, we see we are to be like spiritual parents to those we are investing into and those we are growing. If there was a child that was stuck in a pit or surrounded by wolves, what would a father do? They would go and help them. They would go and care for them and protect them. They would lead their child to safety. They would lead them in safe paths. We as Christians need to do this with one another spiritually. And yet, too often, we're happy to leave Christians surrounded by the walls of false teaching or stuck in the pit of temptation and sin. And we we don't do anything and we don't care for them. We just leave them there. We shouldn't be doing this. We should want to be like a father. And I think a great way to apply this and help us do this in our lives with one another is just to think those who are under you, those you're investing into, those you're teaching and caring for spiritually, think of them like children. What would a father do with them? How would a father care for them? And then do that spiritually with that person and care for them. This is how Paul, Silas and Timothy dealt with the Thessalonians. And we see when they did this, verse 13 to 16, it goes into some other things, but we see there they accepted God's word. They accepted what Paul, Silas and Timothy taught as God's words and they believed. But after this happened, back sort of in the story with Acts 17, after this happened, Paul, Silas and Timothy, they share the gospel, but then what happens is persecution arises. And there's fierce persecution that happens. And so the believers in the town of Thessalonica have to smuggle Paul and Silas out of the city. They smuggle them out. And because of this, it means that Paul and Silas aren't able to do a lot of foundational teaching. They're, they have to leave quite abruptly. And they're not able to do some of the things they really long to do with the Thessalonians. And this is why we see some of what's going on in these chapters. And this heart longing for them to go and see the Thessalonians again. Because they were unable to do what they wanted to do. They didn't get to fully accomplish all the teaching that they wanted to. And for some reason now we're seeing still Satan is hindering them from going. Satan is hindering them. Verse 18 in chapter 2 shows us. And and so they, they don't know what to do. They want to see the Thessalonians grow and endure, but they can't go. And they have an intense longing to see them. So what do they do? Well, we're going to see, they're going to send Timothy because they can't go for some reason and we don't know why. But we see something else here that I think we need to grow in. Paul has an intense longing. And Silas, they have an intense longing for the Thessalonians when they can't see them. We need to be like that as well. Have a look at verse 17 to 18. We see their burning heart for the Thessalonians. It says, but brothers, when we were torn away from you, that's when the persecution arose and they had to get out of the town and they couldn't do any more teaching. When we were torn away from you for a short time in person, not in thought, out of our intense longing, we made every effort to see you, for we wanted to come to you. Certainly I did, Paul, again and again, but Satan stopped us. That was an intense longing for them to see these Christians. And I just want to ask us, is that in us? Is that intense longing in us? Just to see each other, but also to grow each other. Is Is there an intense longing even at the moment? At the moment, when it's sometimes a bit harder to get together and it's sometimes a bit easier to avoid getting together, do we have this intense longing to see one another? If we're God's family, saved into God's family, we should long to be with God's family and to see one another. And so you need to ask, for some of you, if you listen to this at home, and that's the only time you listen to this and it's not anyone here, but some of you may be at home eventually going to listen to this. Is this the only time you're listening to this and you only want to listen to it at home and you don't want to come now because of the the way we're able to live stream and avoid coming? Is that you? Or do you have an intense longing to be with your spiritual family? You should if you're a Christian. I know it's different times and we're running in different ways because of this virus, but there should always be in us an intense longing to be with one another and to see each other face to face And yet, unfortunately, sometimes among us, we have people, or we ourselves, don't want to come, or aren't really willing to risk coming, or find the couch too comfortable and it's just too easy to watch it on a screen rather than coming and encouraging one another. We should have an intense longing to see one another. And that's what Paul and Silas had. They wanted to see the Thessalonians and they wanted to grow them. Why did they want to see them so badly? 
Well, look at the verses after. Verse 19 to 20, we've already seen it. Because they were their joy, their crown, their hope. To see them grow and endure was life to them. As you remember we said at the beginning. That's why they wanted to see them. That's why they wanted to go and see them. But they've been hindered. And so like I said before, they have to send Timothy. And you see that in verses 1 to 5. We can't dig into it. There's not enough time. But they send Timothy to, to hear, how's the church going after we left? We preached the gospel. We didn't get to do everything we wanted to do with them. How are they going? Timothy goes and he brings back a report. And they hear how the church is going. And we see here, it says the report was good. Verse 6. Chapter 3, verse 6. They heard good news about your faith and love. Now, where did this report, where do we see some of the details of this report? Well, it's back in chapter 1. Chapter 1 shows us really the report that Timothy gave and how they knew, how Paul and Silas knew that their visit, that first visit they did, it wasn't a failure. Chapter 2 says, says that our visit to you was not a failure. They knew their visit wasn't a failure because Timothy brought the report of chapter 1 back to them. And in chapter 1, you see a great report, how they're growing in faith, love, and hope. You see how the gospel came to them and it changed them. It did something. That's what the gospel does when it really comes into our lives. It changes us. It came with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with conviction, it says in chapter 1. And it changed them. It caused them to be imitators of Paul and Silas and ultimately of Christ and it caused them to be a model of other believers and it caused them to do what they did in verse 9 and 10 of chapter 1, to turn from idols and to serve the true living God. The gospel came and changed them and this is the good report that Paul and Silas hear from Timothy and that he brings back to them. And then this is why Paul, Silas and Timothy can say what we started with at the beginning in verses 7 to 9. Chapter 3, verse 7 to 9. Because of this great report that has come from Timothy, Paul, Silas, and Timothy can say this in verse 7. Therefore, brothers, in all our distress and persecution, we were encouraged about you because of your faith. For now we really live since you are standing firm in the Lord. You see the backdrop to the verses now? Paul, Silas, and Timothy wanted to know that the Thessalonians were enduring. They wanted to know that they continued in Christ, that they were following Him, that they found joy in Christ. That's why they now really live. That's joy to them, verse 9 says. That's life to them, seeing the Thessalonians do that. And that's why they long to see them again, as verse 10 says, and they long to supply what is lacking in their faith. Now, we can't dig into more of this passage. There's so much more we could say. But I wanted us to see a big view of their interaction together, the powerful interaction of Paul, Silas, and Timothy with the Thessalonian church so that we can learn how we should interact with each other and how we should be making disciples with with one another and how we should view it and what we should do as we do it. We should be like Paul, Silas, and Timothy and model ourselves of them. We should learn from their example and have their heart longing for other Christians. We should have their desire to be with other Christians, to see them grow in the faith. We should be like them and model their example. Now, for some final application, I want to just give four ways that you can further follow up some of these things that we've been looking at. The first one, this is to church leaders. This is to me and to church leaders. We need to be doing this first. We need to be doing this. We need to model this deep care to the sheep, to the church. We need to model this discipling and this getting into one another's lives and desiring to grow them. It first needs to happen in us. We must be doing it. I must be doing it. We as a leadership need to be concerned about the church's holiness, that they would find joy in Christ. We need to be concerned about the wolves, the false teaching that may be present. We need to be concerned about the pits of temptation that they're stuck in. And we need to pull them out and seek to spiritually care for them just like Paul, Silas and Timothy did. How can we, how can I as a church leader, how can we as church leaders expect the sheep to be doing this with one another if we aren't doing it? So we as church leaders, first and foremost, must be doing this work. Secondly, a way of application for you guys and for all of us is we need intergenerational discipling. If you're a Christian, 
you need to go and you need to seek someone that you can grow. Someone younger than you in the faith. Someone that you can invest into and input into. Seek to do this. It might be on Sundays as you catch up with them. It might be in the youth ministry. It might be in the kids' ministry as you lead in those things. It might be in other ways, and it will be as well, individually, in your own time. But seek to do that with someone. Grow them in the faith. Invest into them. And seek to give them reason to find joy in Christ and to follow Him. A third point for application Go and seek someone to get this from. Find someone older than you. Find someone to grow from. Find someone mature that you look up to, that you can ask, how am I going in the faith? Where do I need to grow? What areas do I need to work on? Find someone that you can do this with in your life and grow from them and learn from them. We all need this. We all really need this. You need to get spiritually from people, but you also need to give, like I said before. You need to give into the lives of others, but you need to get from someone as well. And be grown from them. And then a fourth way of application. We've been saying it throughout. We need to get into one another's lives. We need to do this more. We need to get into each other's lives. We need to get to know one another. And we need to seek how we can progress each other in the faith. And we need to do hospitality. That's going to mean having people into our homes. Opening our homes. Having people into our lives more. And I guess as a way of encouragement in this. To help us do this. And be more hospitable. Can I encourage us? Let's not be extravagant in how we do it. Let's not feel we have to do three-course meals or we have to always have dessert if we have someone over. Let's not feel we have to have the house perfect if we're having someone over. Let's just seek to do it. It doesn't matter what we eat. That doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter if the house is clean, really. It matters having people over to encourage them and grow them in the faith. That's what matters. It's not about showing how great a cook you are or how perfect your house is. It's about helping people to find joy in Christ. But unfortunately, sometimes our hospitality becomes more about those things, doesn't it? Looking good, having a clean house, having great meals on the table, and we miss out on doing what we really should be doing in our hospitality. So let's aim to get into each other's lives and be simple. Be simple in how we do it. Let's all just be simple so that we can do it well and focus on the priority. Well, this is what life is all about because now, Paul, Silas and Timothy say, now we really live if we see people standing firm in the faith. Can you say that? Do you every day wake up thinking and saying, I know that I remain and I continue for people's progress and joy in the faith so that through my being with them, they will overflow with joy in Christ. Can we say that like Paul did? Is this why you're living? Is this what you're aiming to do? Every day that you wake up, in every moment that you have, is that what you're seeking to do? Are you saying, as you wake up, God's given me another day to help people find joy in Christ? As a mother, as a student, as a friend, as a a worker, as a fellow shopper or a bus rider, are you thinking in that moment, how can I help this person find joy in Christ, grow to know Him more? Are you thinking that in every moment of every day. This should be the lens that we're looking at life through. We should be looking at life through this lens. How can I grow people to find joy in Christ? That should be our aim. Let's continue to push on as that as our priority and purpose to help people overflow with their joy in Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for powerful examples. The example of Paul, Silas and Timothy. Oh, how we need their example, God, to be challenged and convicted. We thank you that it has been preserved and that we can learn from it. And we pray, God, that you would grow us to be like them. We pray, God, that you would give us a deep care and concern for one another. Give us an intense longing and love for one another as we've seen in Paul, Silas and Timothy. May we love one another, God. May we not hate each other in how we deal with one another, but may we be loving and seek to grow each other in the faith. Please, God, teach us more on this. Help us to grow more in this area. And may we do all of these things for your glory and honor. Amen. We're going to sing.